micro meetups here we are um i think you've all been here before so i'll skip the part of what is this um so what we got coming up mm -hmm. is all this cool stuff uh virtual filmmaking hand sewn paper art is in a couple weeks uh some word games with alicia dale is coming up Ooh. in september sometime um, Woo -hoo! So you can do a micro meetup just like Phil is. That's how I roped him into all this. Um, we usually work together uh, long hours, late, weird projects for humongous clients. And uh, this might be the first time I've seen you in the daytime in a while, Phil. Wow. Uh, <laughs> it's so Yeah, you can go there. And I believe uh, I'm going to stop sharing and give it to... Okay. Mmm. Sweet. Wow. How big is that? I'm sorry? How big is that? That is actually a little small. It's uh, probably uh, five by five or four by four. Sweet. And then uh, there's a frame around it that I wanted to make. Um, focus in on the, on the center there. Um, so um, let me just uh, say I'm a metal point artist. It's uh, new for me. It's a new medium. I'm really, really that I really enjoy is the process and materials that go into making uh, the pieces. And uh, I want to start off by saying uh, we will probably start talking about a lot of, um, given my subject matter, usually. Um, it has some kind of scientific, spiritual aspect to it. And I want to quote uh, Evelyn Wall in uh, one of these, uh, in. Um, Rides had revisited where one of the characters, Charles Ryder, asks um, question, uh, if he really believes in all that nonsense, the spiritual aspect of his uh, Catholicism. And uh, Sebastian responds with, uh, of course I do, it's lovely. So, what I want to say is we might be talking about a lot of stuff like that, but you should take it with a grain of salt. I'm no sky pilot. Um, and uh, I just am very open to um, ideas of consciousness and, and science and portraying my ideas of how um, our consciousness may relate to our existence. So that being said, it's just, uh, it's a lovely sort of world that I'm trying to build uh, in the work that I create. It's not uh, necessarily completely narrative, but uh, um, it does have relationships to, you know, ancient philosophy, uh, modern philosophy, and definitely um, modern or new science. So it's nothing where, uh, I'm expressing one idea over the other. It's uh, simply abstract in some, and oftentimes a very subjective way. Um, this piece you see here is uh, called, um, let's see. Well, no, it's not works in progress. <laughs> I hit the wrong thing. Um, it's called Archeos, and it's uh, the idea of ancient Platonic idea, of a uh, monist idea in which the universe is created uh, by one thing. Um, so, um, I think I'm getting a little deep. I might want to go into, first of all, my, uh, um, how many of you are 
point or sometimes often called silver point? Uh-oh. No, no. <coughs> you're break you're, no. You're breaking okay. up a little. What break was your question again? Yeah, you cracked up, so. I cracked up, okay. Um, what, what was the um, question again? Well, the question is how many of you are familiar with a um, metal point, uh, the metal point medium? No. No. No? Okay. All right. <laughs> well, please enlighten us. We know nothing. Uh, I'd love to. Okay. So, um, metal point is a uh, very old technique uh, that artists used to use to make very detailed drawings. Uh, with stylized uh, styluses or stele, uh, and initially um, they are uh, the stele are created using uh, precious metals. Uh, spe more specifically, uh, at some point it's called silver point, and it use, uh, uses a silver wire on a specially prepared ground um, in order to make marks on that ground. That white ground looks very much simply like drawing on paper with graphite. However, my work tends to really want to bring out the elemental quality of it. And I, I use materials like uh, 24 karat gold, pure silver, platinum, bronze, and copper. And we used to create images with this. And I love the concept of bringing out the specularity of um, the images, or, um, specifically the uh, line quality having a particular specular uh, or specularity to it. Uh, the grounds, uh, uh, the idea here is a drawing with uh, noble metals. And then the ground, of course, is created it's often created with, uh, you know, kind of a gypsum or um, a bone ash, uh, but there are other materials that one can use and um, usually made of minerals. Uh, so the marks are made with uh, noble metals, like I said, the gold, the platinum, the silver, and sometimes copper. And the ground sometimes, uh, as in the image you're seeing here, um, the background is uh, uh, pigmented with the malachite to give it a green tone. If you see this color right here, that is because it is shining with gold. And it's not a gold ink, it's not a gold um, paint. It is simply the, as a pencil would draw upon graphite. So it's like a gold pencil that you would use on the ground? Yeah. So here, I'll show you a little example here. I prepared um, a little Google Doc. I thought I'd be funny and show you some uh, of my pre-high uh, school junior high work. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Focus, focus. My superhero and like, you know, OK. So. Uh, but I'll skip a little bit right here to the medium I'm using. Uh, can you see my cursor or not? Uh, yep. Yes. Curious. Yes. Okay. So here, what you'll see. Um, let's see if I can. Uh, enlarge it for you. Uh, is how the metal uh, filings when it when it's drawn with it. Uh, is drawn on paper, and this is the way it looks right here. This is gold. This would be nickel. Um, here's aluminum. And many people use aluminum uh, because of the fact that it makes the darkest mark. This is bismuth, zinc. Uh, but when sh uh, shown or uh, lit with a, um, a point source of light, you can see on the right here that um, they actually shine with the color of the uh, metal that's used. 
So this is brass, and this is uh, gold, this is copper, and uh, this is nickel. So those two images are the and same piece of art, so to speak, right. just with different light? Yeah, if you notice, this is at an angle, so it's um, approaching from uh, the, the camera is hitting it from a different angle. Okay. Uh, these are the stele that I use. Um, this one here on the left, I've, I've, I make a, a little wire, um, it's about three millimeters of uh, aluminum. This is about four millimeters of solid platinum. This is about a two, mil two millimeter uh, wire or uh, rod of pure silver. And I use pure silver instead of sterling silver because these metals um, are noble metals and uh, not oxidized. Or what, what, what does I noble can mean? leave a fixative off there. Well, what a noble metal is uh, part of the, sure. Uh, a noble metal is a metal that does n is not a is an element essentially and does not um, is not mixed with any other metal. If you look at the periodic, you'll see gold, you'll see platinum, and those are uh, those metals are the noble metals, and they don't oxidize. Um, a lot of times you'll see sterling silver and sterling silver is mixed with a certain amount of tin. I'm not tin, uh, other materials, I'm not quite sure. Um, and that creates uh, a tarnish. Um, and many, many uh, silver point artists use sterling silver. However, using pure silver um, reduces the oxidization uh, on the uh, substrate or the ground. Uh, so, and this one is a very small piece of gold. This is silver. Now, this piece right here is copper, and that adds, um, which is not a noble metal, uh, but it is an element. And I'm still waiting to see if it actually oxidizes into some kind of green covering. I think that would be very, very cool. If it doesn't, then that's okay, because it leaves a beautiful uh, sort of copper color to it. Right here is brass, uh, I mean bronze, uh, which is uh, copper and tin. So that is an alloy. And these are all uh, what are called jeweler's vices that I use to secure the pin and, and draw with. Um, my early career or my early art, right? Um, I went to the School of the Art Institute and I studied under um, a woman named Isobel McKinnon who really changed, changed my life. Um, or at least I really, uh, I resonated very much with her approach to figure drawing. And you can see here some of the notes I took, uh, uh, seeing the structure and some sort of isometric perspective, creating space, creating a gestalt between the, if you can see here, this is the, <laughs> my very, uh, rudimentary girl at the half open door uh, where she, uh, by, um, I think it's um, Rembrandt and uh, space. And it's a sort of um, technique that was used uh, in the Renaissance uh, of isometric perspective to draw figures and planes and create space uh, within the picture plane. Um, with that, I drew, I used to draw little, you know, uh, exercises like this, um, where I would draw figures in this isometric perspective. But now, um, I've kind of moved on from that, and uh, I'll show you a little bit of specularity that exists.
as you can see in the still uh, image, this is the specularity of the of the gold that I use on the figure, and I use uh, a kind of chalk to create the highlights. And on the wings, there is a copper. So uh, you may have been able to notice the difference in color. It is subtle, however, it is there. Um, let's close it up. And uh, I can show you some of my work. First, one of my most my latest works here is called Concourse. And um, here is a, a little video for that. This piece is embellished uh, with uh, 24 karat gold leaf, in addition to the um, metals that are used. Uh, as you can see, uh, the figures are uh, ballet dancers, and they have uh, what you might uh, see hearkening back to uh, my early days where I was uh, studying uh, shapes and movement in space, um, as you can see here. But of course, uh, my art is influenced by a lot of different things. Um, I am uh, Greek American. Uh, my name is Phil, but my real name is Philoclitis, which is a Greek name, named after my grandfather. Cool. And uh, these are, um, you know, just some images I put together. I've had growing up Byzantine um, or uh, Greek Orthodox, uh, not a very religious person, but it certainly interest, uh, influenced my life. And reconciling uh, the spirituality of, of uh, what I see in, in Byzantine icons growing up, uh, especially being uh, a young gay man. Uh, or kid when I was growing up, looking up at the icon and seeing uh, Jesus' um, ripped abs. It might be a sacrilegious, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> but that were some of the things that I, I uh, that influenced my art growing up. But going into, um, this might date me here, 1985, uh, going to the School of the Art Institute and seeing this show uh, the Spiritual uh, in Abstract Painting from 1890 to 1985. And after seeing the show, I, I reconciled this sort of thing, this sort of thing, and this sort of thing into a thought process. And I will uh, show you some of the um, ideas or the imagery that comes to my head when I when I think of art or think of drawing or when I think of uh, an image I want to produce. This is an image uh, by Piet Mondrian. And he is, an, uh, of course, everyone is very familiar with that name, maybe. Um, if you're not, let me know. Uh, but he's more, uh, he is more well known for his very geometric um, segmentation of space. Uh, but his early work has these uh, beautiful, almost geometric um, figures in a very spiritual sort of enlightenment um, image. The flat planes uh, that exist in the breasts and the body and the creating space with the tonality. Um, and in fact, even the Navel is triangular. 
uh, uh, all these geometric forms come together to uh, create these images. Here we have Kandinsky's man uh, amazed by a uh, non-Euclidean fly. Here are some of the other pieces where you see uh, things in perspective with sort of a randomness that happens in space that around it. And these are the sorts of things that uh, influence me. Here's uh, Giacometti. Uh, this was something that uh, uh, one of my instructors asked me to look at because he was very interested in how space enclosed these sculptural figures. Here on the left is one of um, the only uh, female cubist, cubist work by um, a woman. And she was the teacher of my husband. At the Art Institute, I learned, I was, uh, I was taught or expressed uh, to um, about two types of drawing. One that is drawing what you see. And uh, the sort of perspective um, and breaking up of, of space. This again right here is um, what looks very cubist, but is also Piet Morian. Um, it's something about drawing what he knows, um, looking around. And it is developing the volumetric space from within that. But that space is something we all exist in. And I've endeavored to, uh, a lot of my art talks about a, uh, an idea of that space um, being related to our consciousness. Here are some uh, esoteric concepts here. And here's what you might be more familiar with, Mondrian. Um, so my art started to get these sketches started to become a little more abstract and the ideas um, of, but I, I never went fully abstract. And this isometric perspective that exists in the space that's being created is, is, is punctuated by these wings, these birds and wings on the right with this sphere, um, which you may have seen um, uh, in the finish earlier. This is, um, I called the cosmos at the time, but um, uh, is also an idea called the appearing. And these lines or curves or straight lines um, get intersected by other lines. And so my concept is that these lines are people's consciousness and the interaction with other people and their, their ideas that, that towards in some way yours. And um, not only interact, but many ideas that augment your, your, your thoughts into what might be considered a curve. Um, so instead of being very draconian and moving in straight lines, um, many curves happen. And uh, they happen because of the influence of your surroundings and the consciousnesses that are around you, your friends, your family, and all these things. Um, this, of course, influences uh, you know, dance, could be a dance within space. Uh, but the science that occurs uh, that um, after 1985, from 1992, when the Large Hadron Collider effect started coming out, I started seeing images like where particles are struck and, uh, and uh, they're rammed into each other. And these are the actual images that are formed. Um, Log logarithmic spirals that pass off and are being spewed out from uh, the ramming of particles together. So it's not like I'm trying to come up with some kind of ethos. It's just that
the ontological images, the ideas that I, that I experience, and when I see them, I'm you know, my own kinds, and then I have a vision and want to draw it in some way. I think one of the most, the coolest one I think uh, right now is this new concept of and initially uh, what happens is Could you say that the again? Idea that Picking up a little bit. A, a, a physical, a new concept of physics called the unified theory of uh, geometric randomness. And you see um, many things, you know, the spiritual and geometry and many of those things like that. And yes, the, you know, the, that's fascinating, but they aren't, um, you know, the, the concept of 3.14 or 1.6 uh, uh, or 1.68 is, uh, is the mathematical symbol of, of phi, which is the logarithmic spiral which is related to the golden mean. Um, and you hear a lot of kind of esoteric and uh, very um, new agey sort of ideas about it. But I, uh, I, I'm a little skeptical in, in that regard because it's not endemic uh, to our world. It does exist. However, this is fascinating to me uh, because the idea of uh, these, uh, this geometric um, randomness is a concept that replaces uh, uh, string theory. And the idea is that there is an alternate dimension where these lines are perfect. But when they interact with our worlds, if you see here the, the that sort of isometric. But these lines are uh, in a perfect way, uh, perfect uh, strands, but when they interact with our universe or our dimension, they're subject to our laws and the gravity and, um, and um, effects of our physics, they're warped. And I made a connection there um, in my head, and this is just, you know, one of those, I, I consider it a kind of a lovely concept that this new idea is related to um, the allegory of the cave, where there is a, a perfect dove, um, but uh, when a light is shined upon it, you see it in two dimensions uh, in our world, um, on a wall, and it's somehow augmented or changed, and it's not that perfect thing anymore. Um, and so that relates uh, to this as if these, these higher beings are somehow breaking out of what in, in my uh, Byzantine iconography, oops, sorry. Um, you see a lot of gold being used, and that gold in um, a religious sense represents that sort of perfect world. Um, and here you see these uh, figures that are created in some kind of crystalline fashion, somehow breaking out of uh, uh, or uh, coming into our world um, and breaking out of uh, what you see, these gold shards that might very well be. Bill, do you put the gold the on after you do the drawing part? Or and is it on yes. the same layer? Is it on the same layer? Another thing. I, I, sorry, I didn't mean to digress. Yes. Um, the, the cool thing about that um, is that if you see these drawings um, or these images, the um, gold leaf is you is um, I use the ancient technique that is used for these icons, which is a bole uh, or what's called a bole, which is a clay 
that is spread or you know painted onto the surface, and um, then that clay is is polished or highly burnished um, with uh, several different layers of microfiber, uh, uh, like a sandpaper. Once it's dry and it becomes very shiny, um, and uh, then I have to uh, use uh, what's called a size, um, and I steam that onto the clay, and I, I can breathe on the clay and to give it a certain moisture once it's, once it's, um, uh, once it's dry. And then it gives it a certain moisture, which allows when I take the gold leaf, the, the gold leaf, um, and gold leaf is crazy. It will, it goes everywhere. It's, it's a very, very difficult thing to work with. Um, and um, you can, um, after masking all that off, I, I put the gold leaf on while it's moistured, uh, moisturized with my, and stick to that surface. And once that surface is, um, once that's dry, um, it, it can be burnished with an agate stone. And there are several uh, uh, materials here, or uh, uh, tools that I use. And I, I wish I could show you. I can show you after this, after I change. Maybe I can stop sharing screen for a second. You can see this. This is an agate uh, stone uh, burnisher. This is agate. And um, there are a couple of different sizes that I use. Uh, the other one is missing, of course. Um, one is very flat. And um, that is used to burnish the gold leaf once it's dry upon the surface. Um, another unique concept is that, or a cool thing about this is that I've created this, this new sort of substrate or ground and I made it a, a very dark ground and it actually allows the color of the metals to be very much more evident. But what's cool is that I can actually use this agate stone to burnish the actual line. The individual line to a sheen. Um, and uh, so I'm actually uh, polishing the drawing, so to speak, to give it a little bit more of a, of a shine and a specular and movement. Um, I know that, I mean, the idea, a lot of uh, the work that I'm showing you can be, you know, created digitally. Uh, and in fact, um, I do prepare uh, my stuff um, digitally. I work it out first digitally. Uh, am I sharing screen again? Yes? Yeah, you are. Yes. Okay. And um, uh, I can go here and uh, go to my uh, works in progress and show you some of the digital work um, that I'm preparing. Come along now. If you can see it here, this is a, a you know a digital maquette, basically of of what I intended to do. But it is actually um, what I just showed you, the uh, thing I have on my desk where I showed you the the um, the burnishing of the materials, is the actual piece that I'm using to recreate this. So um, this is the digital piece, and. This is 
um, the actual piece that I oh, I slap again and parts of now it's a little dark. Um, piece. And I can um, you know pretty much recreate the digital piece in 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 real life with real materials uh, but not pixels um, real metal and gold so the materials that I use are are precious in some way and, and the ideas to me are um, uh, um, has that sort of kind of um, mental value in some way. Um, so you do uh, the that. digital pieces uh, as a study before you do the actual like, metal pieces. I did not hear the whole thing. Oh, I said you do the digital drawings as a study kind of leading up to actually doing the larger, bigger metal pieces? Absolutely. Yes. And then I use either use a grid or uh, some sort of projector to um, project it onto a larger uh, canvas or uh, wooden substrate. Um, in this case, in the case of concourse, um, I used a very thick um, aluminum um, board uh, or uh, aluminum plate, which is about, you know, uh, three eighths uh, of uh, uh, thick aluminum, which gives it a kind of uh, a weight uh, to it. Um, but uh, there's a drawing here. Um, which I'm uh, intending to do by 30, 30 by 20, uh, 30 by 18, or 29 by 18. And this is um, uh, Athena. And the digital pencils or the digital uh, tools that I use, I made them emulate what they would look like um, on the actual the actual substrate. Uh, so if you can see this is these this is gold and this would be bronze. I would use the bronze and the and the copper. And, and other parts would be gold and this background would be silver. You know of course the female of course is the goddess of wisdom and she is holding her spear in a very um, wise manner. Um, I'm a, my background is a fencer, um, and what she is doing is, is holding a spear, uh, the spear in a way where she understands her distance. Her concept is that she only fights um, with wisdom and not out of anger. Um, so she is, uh, uh, her owl of wisdom is, is emanating from her eyes and looking into the distance um, and seeing her target. Um, and anyway, um, that's just my, my little story behind the geometry. The relationships I've already mentioned as well. Um, I have uh, some, um, one political piece, uh, this piece, quiescent um, and it's sort of a, a take on where I intend to create this uh, very literally almost uh, literally a, a Byzantine icon but in my own way um, showing the uh, key or the um, Iperion instead of the world that is being held by uh, this patron saint 
Uh, he seems, uh, it's called quiescent, where he's silent. And so the idea that that the spirituality exists, but um, these higher beings somehow are very mysterious and silent. And uh, that's why I call it uh, quiescent. Other concepts just uh, are talking about uh, figures moving through space. Um, this one called uh, is moving through several uh, planes uh, in space. All drawn, you know, uh, in metal paint. Um, my finished works. Oop, those are works in progress. Here's my finished works. Are uh, another. This is another one called uh, toxicity. And um, this is again on the same sort of ground that, um, like that sort of. Uh, well, it doesn't sort of. It amplifies the uh, uh, the metal that is used to create the drawing. Um, and you can see it in this um, in this video. And so that is gold. And you can see how the gold shines. So all the highlights and midtones are made with different, but a building of tonality, um, you know, a building up of tone by uh, either cross hatching or a circular motion of the stylus across the, the the ground. And what you'll see is uh, here is. Uh, different parts of the piece are um, uh, different parts. Oh, you can't see it right here. Um, uh, different parts of the piece is uh, has a different sort of value, and so so for example, this value here is done with silver. And the greater the amount of layer of silver that I that I um, draw onto it uh, creates a more opaque um, tone. But certain highlights like here and here are accented, uh, very, very sharp highlights are accented with platinum. And then on top of the platinum, I use aluminum. And I mentioned earlier that many uh, silver point artists use aluminum because on a white substrate, it creates the darkest tone. But on this ground, the aluminum actually is the brightest. So it can be used to create a very, very sharp highlight. And in that way, I don't have to use um, any kind of chalk or other material to create any part of the drawing. All the darks are made from the substrate color and then every other tone or value um, in the drawing is made by using uh, different uh, metals and uh, different um, build up of tone on that metal. Um, his so halo Phil, is, yeah. Phil is the ground on a metal surface, a substrate, or is it on something else? Um, I use two kinds of, uh, so one is wood. This is done on wood. Um, but uh, uh, this piece here, concourse, is done on aluminum. 
Uh, and the aluminum can be uh, sanded to a very fine, very uh, and, uh, polished surface to give the ground a nice smooth finish. I kind of uh, enjoy the, uh, the the kind of rough surface that creates because uh, it makes the um, material or the the lines show up better um, in metal. Uh, the idea of this this idea of a line or intersecting lines which are uh, sort of striking the figure um, in a way that is uh, somehow negative and um, he's not he doesn't have the jubilation that uh, exists in some of the other uh, drawings I have um, however um, as a foil to that um, there's this drawing called a toxic or Nepenthes, uh, Nepenthes, which is kind of a drug that is the way uh, their fear and their sour and sorrow and their pain. And um, this is a uh, concept where um, these two beings are interacting and, and, and those beings are and one of uh, mercy and and um, love is, is, is helping the other. Um, and um, that's that drawing. But this drawing is done on a um, uh, sort of mid-tone. So the highlights here are done with a um, India ink uh, in white. And then this is, of course, gold leaf. And again, you see the, the usual um, alphabet or vocabulary of the mental space that uh, the images exist within. Um, here's a very almost literal version of that, which I call dossier. And it's a, a, a diptych where um, this arche um, or the this sphere, the alpha, the omega, or the or what I what would call the the bando creator, which is the, the great creator, is this sphere, and there are many that happen, um, and here I intend to fill with maybe gold or something, or this might be gold and this might be, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> Uh, but the spheres that interact with each other and the lines that interact with those spheres that create the spheres in general uh, create our reality. And um, it has a relationship to um, uh, the caduceus rod of Hermes, who was the, it's a, uh, who was the, the scribe of the gods. So it's that sort of communication that's happening. And, it, you know, it's a little bit of mythos and little fun that's happening because it's lovely to me. Um, uh, which is point space. And uh, here's another video you can see this is one of my first uh, versions of it. But you can see how the metal I create a very rough substrate and the uh, sort of very loose uh, metal uh, line art and line quality is highlighted by the specular of the, the actual metal that it's used to draw with. Um, To just quickly go past this port sort of thing, the spirituality and abstract art is something um, you can finish here uh, under that influence. Um, but also things that influence me are, are dance and the, the figure and these other 
images. This here is an image of the idea that maybe those, those figures that are breaking through the space are actually another dimensional being that we only see because um, of a, a four dimensional object that is moving through our space that at some point becomes invisible because it goes in a direction we can't see. Um, this is one soul line in the world where it's being influenced by all kinds of different things and you move in a path or a, a direction in your life. Another thing, um, as you may have noticed, there are some esoteric ideas here. Um, you know, the geometric idea, um, this logarithmic spiral, spiral that can create this dodecahedron of perfect solids. That's itself in old fencing manuals. And uh, this is actually the Academy of the Sword written by uh, Girard Kibou. One of my students in Chicago is the curator of the Art Institute of Chicago's Arms and Armor exhibit, and he allowed me to um, personally uh, look at the at an original print uh, printed book of this uh, of, of this fencing manual. But as you can see, it has all based on Renaissance ideas of uh, a geometric universe. This is a, an image of, of a, a Jewish um, angel named Metatron, and this is an image that is supposedly uh, encompasses all the perfect solids of Pythagoras. So adding a little spirituality to that, so that geometry. Another thing that influences me is mannerism. And uh, I love the elongated figures of uh, El Greco, these long fingers, these sort of um, stylized fabrics, and then pre-Raphaelites, which their subject matter is, comes from, you know, um, a kind of fantasy, but not the sort of Lord of the Rings fantasy, but a kind of fantasy that the has a certain realism and beauty to it. Here is a, a little bit of vulgarity. <laughs> uh, and this is um, Aubrey Beardsley, who wrote uh, La Morte d'Arthur. And you can see the relationship of this image and The image here of that's on a plate of uh, Patroclus and Achilles, and uh, this is one of my favorite base paintings, and it uh, it shows uh, a kind of tenderness between um, of course Patroclus was uh, Achilles's uh, lover, and uh, I always find that. Uh, uh, quite comforting um, going on. And uh, so basically that is the, that's the end of my explanation of what my art could mean. And uh, or if someone looks at it, they get their own ideas and I hope their ideas are, are um, something that they find lovely. I hope you enjoyed the, I hope you enjoyed it and not just still uh, uh -huh. if you have any questions please because it's Sorry, tiny on my screen what is your uh, website address oh it's um uh i think you should put uh, that in the chat because nobody will spell that right i am yeah. going, i am going to put that in the chat <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> I'm sorry if a lot of this was very small. I, I, I didn't realize that it was that small. Um, let me, uh, where is the chat now? Here it is. Down by the share screen. Got it. 
So it's uh, www. There it is. And uh, I hope you can enjoy it and see it. Um, and, uh, I have a question, Bill. Yeah. Um, so how, how expensive does one of your paintings get just from the amount of precious metal that is on it? Uh, that's something I'm, I'm still working out. <laughs> um, the amount of work that goes in is, uh, is quite a bit. Um, I mean, just the cost of the metal. Do you know what that is? Actually, no, I don't. Um, I know one thing that I think is very cool about um, the materials. But, well, the, the cost of the, of the gold leaf can get quite expensive, uh, considering how, uh, d depending on how much I use. Mm -hmm. um, but the actual lines that I'm making, the Platinum, this platinum piece right here, oh, this platinum piece, it's actually quite heavy. Um, I actually um, polished myself. I got it from a jeweler here in New York. And um, this cost me $300 for just this little piece. The gold is cheaper, uh, the silver is cheaper. But what's interesting though, is that I really don't, um, once the, the, the metal doesn't really like a pencil get filed down so that it needs sharpening, um, it will last for a very, very long time. So the initial cost was very expensive. Uh, however, I haven't need I had no need to buy more paint or more anything to make the mark. The only thing that was ex is expensive are some of the powdered pigments that I used that I used for the um, ground, and of course the gold leaf that I used. Um, I figured that I have to use genuine gold leaf since the the lines that I'm making are made of genuine metal. Um, and it just, for me, it has a sort of um, a, a, a lovely sort of very real connection when I'm using those, those real metals um, that have uh, such history behind them. Um, so there's not like a Metal Leaf 10 URL where you can just get all of those tips for all of your pens in all of the different metals? You have to go to jewelers and see that? Well, um, okay, so uh, many, of the, uh, many of the places have, um, there's a place called naturalpigments.com and they sell all the material you will need. They'll sell you gold wire. Um, they'll sell you silver wire and pure silver wire. There's that sort of thing. But the platinum I needed to get from a jeweler. And the thickness of, um, uh, of the wire uh, is usually very thin. And so when I want to make larger or thicker or cover more um, surface area, um, it's better to have a thicker, you know, um, rod um, to make thicker lines with. And um, so those um, uh, places usually sell you very thin um, pieces of metal. Um, so I went to a special jeweler to, to ask for uh, something a little, uh, a little, little thicker so that I could use it to make, um, um, I uh, so I should cover more surface with my cross hatching. Gotcha. Um, I can put um, some. Let's see.
Uh, I'm trying to find the. Uh, uh, Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's uh, that's one of the places. There's also a place in England that that's uh, not too bad. I don't think I have that here. I, um, I don't know if that's readily available. <laughs> I I want to, um, you know, the uh, as far as how how much uh, one of these was, would cost. I'm. Uh, I'm thinking that uh, a piece of, of, of this size the uh, uh, concourse. I, I would like to, uh, considering my experience and the materials that are here, I would like to I would like to um, bring uh, about two to four thousand um, dollars. Smaller pieces, of course. I'm not sure, you know, how people feel about that, but if, you know, I'm looking for advice from, you know, everyone. So it'd be great to let me know. Hi, George. So, any other questions, anybody? Anyone? Anyone? I think I've, I've, oh, I've spoken a lot. <laughs> Did you say you're teaching at the Art Institute? Oh, no. Um, I am a, um, one of my students, summer exhibit at the Art Institute. And when I was in Chicago, he was one of my fencing students. I am a fencer. So I'm not teaching at the Air Institute, although I would love to. I, I think I'm a very good teacher. A long commute? Say that? I said it's a really long commute for you. It would be a, a long commute. <laughs> well, where are you? I am in Brooklyn. Oh. I uh, moved uh, here about five years ago. Uh, I'm originally from Chicago, and I, uh, I miss it very much. Anyone else? Well, thanks for showing us your cool stuff, uh, Philip. Thank you. Thanks, George. Great. And thank you all for listening. Yeah, great uh, time. Really appreciate it. Very interesting. I don't know anything about this whole metal point. No, yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah. I think yeah. Next week we have uh, stuff on iPhone photography with Robert Potter, I believe. And we got uh, stitched paper art the week after that. So come back and enjoy awesome things. I'm Philip. That's very cool. If you can remember. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and thank you, George, for the opportunity to talk to you. Yay. Goodbye. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, live long and prosper. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh.